everyone, Mike with MJ Scale Modeling here. We're going to be starting another model here today. We're going to be starting with the uh, Sonderkopf Herzog 234 one. Um, and when I start a new model, I like to do a little bit of historical research on the vehicle. So there are actually four variants of this vehicle. I actually have another one uh, kit for one of the variants I'm going to work on later on uh, in the year, hopefully. But uh, I want to do a little bit of research on it and show you it all too. But with the build I did so far and the research, it was a very long video. So this video is just going to encompass the history and the research I did of the SD KFC 234 series. And in the next video, we will we'll get into the build and all that stuff like that. So sit back, enjoy the history of this really cool vehicle. And uh, we'll see you in the next one and we will start uh, building it. So, okay, let's do it. The SDKFZ or Sonderkraft Fahrzeug, which means Special Purpose Vehicle 2341, was actually the second of four vehicles produced in the 234 series. We'll start with the 2341 since that's the model we're building, but we'll still cover the other four models. After World War I, in the shadow of the Versailles Treaty, there was a push for Germany to construct wheeled armored vehicles because they were not restricted by the Versailles Treaty. Armed armored cars were used effectively in World War I, and even more so in the early days of World War II during the Blitzkrieg invasion of Western Europe and Poland. Because of the extreme high pace of the Blitzkrieg, many deficiencies were pretty quickly exposed. Better protection for the crew and better, heavier armament were among some of the key additions desired for the new generation of armored cars. On August 5, 1940, an order was given to design a new style, eight-wheeled armored car similar to the SD KFC 231. As said before, the first vehicle built was the SD KFC 234-2, also known as the Puma or the Garut 93. The 234-2 went into production in September 1943. We'll come back to the 234-2, but right now let's jump ahead in time to June 1944 when the 234-1 went into production. There were three companies involved in the production of the 234 series. Tatra was the company that was in charge of the overall design and the engine, while Busing was in charge of the development of the body. Daimler-Benz and Sichau were in charge of the designing of the new turret. There were three engines designed, but after June 1944, when it became more evident that Rommel was about to be evicted from North Africa and all his crap tossed into the street, a more conventional air-cooled engine was settled on. This engine was a Tatra 103 V12 220 horsepower air-cooled diesel engine. The 234 series had eight-wheeled steering. The 234 transmission also had six forward gears and six reverse gears, while also featuring a dual steering system, one facing forward and one facing backwards. If they had to go backwards for any reason, such as encountering heavy enemy armor or getting into an area where they just couldn't turn the vehicle around, the direction of travel could easily be reversed by just using the dual steering system, and going backwards was something they were doing quite a lot of after June 1944. The overall length of the 234-1 was roughly 19 feet 3 inches, with a width of roughly 7 feet 8 inches, and a height of roughly 6 foot 11 inches. I say roughly because I converted this from the metric system and didn't want to be saying things like 6 feet 10.39 inches. I thought that could get pretty annoying. It had a fuel capacity of 95 gallons with a max speed of about 50 miles per hour. On the road, it had a range of about 621 miles, while off-road, it could only achieve about 372 miles. The main gun on the 234-1 was the 2cm KWK-38 with an MG42 as a coax. It could carry 250 rounds for the KWK-38 with an additional 2,400 rounds for the MG42. The 234-1 was definitely more armored than its predecessors. However, its thickest armor was on the front at 30 millimeters, the sides at 8 millimeters, and the rear at 10 millimeters. So it was fair to say when they encountered superior enemy armor, they ended up as a red stain on the battlefield. The turret was 30 millimeters on the front and 8 millimeters on the sides and rear. The turret was hand traversed and featured an open top design due to a shortage of raw materials. The turret seated to the commander on the left and the gunner on the right. Now we jump back in time to when the first vehicle of the 234 series was put into production, the 234-2. The 234-2 was in production from December 1943 to March 1945. Believe it or not, the 234-2 was originally supposed to be equipped with the KWK-38, but instead was armed with the 5cm KWK-39-1. The 5cm KWK-39-1 was mounted in the turret. 
had 360 degree rotation, a depression of negative 10 degrees and plus 20 degree elevation, and of course had the MG42 as a coax. The armor on the turret was also minimally better. It still featured the 30mm armor on the front, but instead of the 8mm armor on the sides and back, it had 10mm armor on the sides and back. Which is strange, because the 234-2 was actually produced before the 234-1, so they essentially reduced the armor for the 234-1. The 234-2 had all the same characteristics of the future 234-1 in terms of the engine fuel capacity, speed, range, and the crew. However, the length and height were different, with the length extended to 22 feet 3 inches and the height raised to 7 feet 8 inches. With the bigger gun, the ammo stowage was limited to 55 rounds for the main gun, but could still carry the same loadout of ammo for the MG-42, which was 2,850 rounds. Now we are on to the 234-3. This was the least built and personally least effective of the 234 series in my opinion, with only 88 being built between June and December 1944. The 234-3, known as the Stummel or the Garat 94, was mainly a support version of the 234 series. It did not have a turret, but instead had a gun shield around an open top fighting compartment which housed the 7.5cm K51 L24 standard howitzer. The vehicle carried 50 main gun rounds and only 1,950 rounds for the MG42 machine gun, which is strange because all the other models carry 2,850 rounds for the machine gun. The length and height were slightly shorter than the 234-2 series. All the other features of the 234-3 were the same, including the weight, the width, fuel capacity, speed, etc. That was all the same. The main difference was the armored gun shield in place of the turret, which had 15mm armor on the front, sides, and back. Now we are on to the 234-4, the most armored vehicle in the Schwerer Panzerspaffwagen family. The 234-4 was a favorite of the Führer, who personally expedited its development. Kind of feel like Hitler had more important things to worry about later in the war, but he decided to focus on his wonder weapons such as the 234-4. Even though it was a favorite of Hitler, only 89 were produced between the start of production in December 1944 and the end of production in March 1945. Due to the relentless advance of Allied armor, the Germans, now on the defensive and running for their lives, needed a powerful, mobile anti-tank vehicle. The Germans decided to combine the tried and true 234 with the German 7.5cm Pac-40, which was one of World War II's finest anti-tank weapons. The project was so important to Hitler that it was a topic of discussion when Hitler met with Albert Speer in November. Production began using chassis earmarked for the 234-3. The Pac-40 had to be adjusted so it could mount to the 234-4's fighting compartment on a series of steel girders. They used a standard Pac-40 gun shield, but it had to be jury-rigged a little, like cutting out the lower edges so the gun could traverse roughly 20 degrees in every direction. The Pac-40 had a depression of negative 5 degrees and an elevation of plus 22 degrees. Because the larger gun took up so much space and added so much more weight, the 234-4 was only able to carry 36 rounds for the cannon. The length and width of the 234-4 was the same as the 234-3, but due to the Pac-40, the weight was substantially increased. The armor was the same as the 234-3, except the 234-4 had no turret. Sadly, today there are only three complete 234s left in the world. A 234-3 is located at the Tank Museum in Bovington, UK. There is a 234-4 located at the Deutsches Panzer Museum in Münster, Germany. Lastly, there is one more 234-4 at the US Army and Cavalry Collection located at Fort Moore, Georgia, formerly Fort Benning in the United States. There are no surviving 234-1s or 234-2s. I really hope you enjoyed this history of the Sonderkraft Fertzeug 234. I really love doing historical research and love history in general, so I really enjoy making these historical videos of the models I make. So if you like them, please give a thumbs up and uh, leave a comment and join me in the next video for when we actually build the 234. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you in the next one.